Advanced Psychoproctology for Beginners, A-Hole Diagnosis, Treatment, and Prevention, with Dr. Jeremy Sherman. Welcome to Class 6 of our Advanced Psychoproctology course for beginners. Today, we're going to focus on spin dominance, getting the last word even when our last words keep shifting. Absolute spin dominance is how a-holes use the interplay of emotions and words to interpret reality in ways that make them act as though they're invincible. In the last class, we surveyed our natural history and the way it landed us with language, the unique human capacity to weave together emotions and words to form concepts. Unlike other organisms, humans experience two worlds, the real one common to all organisms and the world of our emotion and word-fueled imaginations. In our imaginations, concepts diverge and converge, conflicting and uniting, yielding our perspectives, our framing, filtering, and spin, what we attend to and ignore, what we welcome and resist, in a word, our worldviews. Like all organisms, we have to interact selectively with the real world, taking in what regenerates us and protecting against what degenerates us. Like all animals, we also filter for what feels good, not bad. And with language, we humans also filter within the conceptual realm, our blend of emotions and symbols, feelings and words. In the last session, I emphasized how selective interaction in the conceptual realm manifests as confirmation bias. That's true, but not the whole story. Simplifying, we could say we filter for what's scientifically likely, personally likable, and socially liked. In other words, we screen for truth, comfort in our own skins, and in between, for social conformity. Filtering for likeliness is filtering for what's realistic over what isn't. We must do that or we die. Like all organisms, to survive we must attend to reality. Filtering for truth is the adaptive alignment between our concepts and the real threats and opportunities we face in our ongoing struggle for existence. Reality, or truth, are the names we give to the category containing all such threats and opportunities. Though we can never know all of reality, and no one gets the last word on what it contains, there's little debate about the container itself. We all agree that what's real is what matters to us, the threats and opportunities, direct and indirect, that we must keep our eyes on to survive and thrive. Cliffs are real threats. Toss yourself over one and you'll die. Food, air, and water are real opportunities. Rely on them for self-regeneration. Some people say that really there's no reality. That's self-negating. But more to the point, people only say that. Everyone acts like there is a reality, even those who say there isn't. Some people talk as though there's no knowing reality, as though it's anyone's guess. It is anyone's guess, but some guesses are better than others, as are some methods for guessing. Science's heavy bias against confirmation bias makes for far better guessing. If you want to filter for reality, you can't let yourself be whipsawed around by your personal preferences. There's a trade-off. The more you need personal confirmation or affirmation, the less you'll be able to track and adapt to reality. Again, to get what you want, set aside what you want long enough to see what is. Better informed about your real situation, you can better adapt to its threats and opportunities. Scientists probe and prod reality for direct and indirect threats and opportunities, which, in turn, guide engineers in their pursuit of tools for better fit between us and reality. Still, in a way, we're all scientists, probing for threats and opportunities, living and learning from experience how to live more efficiently and productively within the real world. As with all organisms struggling for their survival within the real world, our highest long-term priority remains filtering for truth, learning from reality checks in the school of hard knocks. But the most immediate and visceral priority for us is filtering for likability, in other words, comfort in our own skins. That's where our confirmation bias resides, 
It's an alliance between our concepts and our immediate emotions. Since doubt and self-doubt are strong negative emotions, we're inclined to filter out discouraging concepts in our preference for encouraging ones. Have you ever sped read a negative evaluation, lousy review, or poison pen letter? Have you ever pulled the phone away from your ear or hung up when someone is cursing you? That's the feeling of confirmation bias surging in to rescue us from discouraging words. Between filtering for what's likely and what's likable, we get the tension I introduced in our first session, our inner scientist and our inner spin doctor. We filter concepts for both realism and self-affirmation. In the long run, reality matters most, but in the short run, feeling good about ourselves feels like it matters more. The instinct to survive is strong. The instinct to avoid discomfort is often stronger. Now, mediating that tension, there's filtering for what's socially liked, in other words, for social conformity, embracing the concepts that make us accepted and popular in our interpersonal exchanges, family, workplace, friendships, and the broader community. Our local society can sober us up about reality or flatter us, encouraging us to feel like we're among the lucky few in some exceptional tribal clique. You might remember this three-way tug from your high school years. Above all, you wanted to feel comfortable in your own skin, which meant being a good student of reality, but also being popular by whatever standards the cool social circles represented. At the extreme, tribal exceptionalism can become a cult of self-affirmation, a mutual admiration society divorced from reality. Not that all mutual admiration societies are cults. Team spirit doesn't necessarily make one a cultist. Spectator sports and churches, for example, provide lovely bubbles of social conformity and likable personal affirmation. Nice, healthy places to visit. Not that those bubbles are safe to live in permanently. How to safely self-flatter will be the topic of our last class session, an exploration of optimal illusion, safe escapism, flattering ourselves in ways that help more than harm. So here we are, each of us in a tug of war between realism and comfort in our own skin, and filtering for both within societies tugging at us from either side. It would be nice if the likely story were always likable, but of course it isn't. Sometimes reality is disappointing, and sometimes we must choose between feeling good about ourselves and conforming to some local standards. Sometimes we have to trust our society as a guide to reality, and sometimes we have to reject our society as unrealistic. Now you'll remember prosody from the last class, the involuntary yet fakeable emotional music that accompanies our words when we speak. Prosody affords us clues into the three tugs we feel. For example, the tight-throated seething of someone uncomfortable in their own skin as they strain to conform to some social standard. Or the embarrassed sing-song of someone trying to deflect some shaming reality check. Prosody is an expression of emotions, but also a way to evoke emotional responses from others. For example, the seductive whispering tone of sweet talk, the shouting tone of intimidation, and the whole palette of other tonal shadings. For evoking emotions, we aren't limited to voice tone. We can also gesture with body language and facial expressions. We don't just say words or share facts. We send all sorts of coloring signals to evoke emotions in others. We're filtering ourselves to meet social standards, but we're also eliciting agreement from others. To express and evoke emotions, we also have at our disposal loaded terms, which will be our focus here today. To understand loading and how a-holes use it, here I'll distinguish between denotation and connotation. I'll define denotation as the meaning of a word, what it refers to, for example, ball meaning a spherical object. And I'll define connotation as the emotional content, simplified to positive or negative, good or bad, yummy or yucky. Not all words have connotations. A ball is a ball, neither good nor bad, but neutral. But plenty of words are loaded, spun with positive or negative connotations. Take a term like open-minded. It denotes a kind of behavior, being receptive to any possibility. Its connotation is positive in current culture. If someone called you open-minded, you would feel complimented, not insulted. In the Middle Ages, being open-minded was called being a heretic, an insult, not a compliment. Indeed, if you were labeled a heretic, you were stripped of your rights. 
When Martin Luther was called to stand trial by the Catholic Church on the charges of heresy, he agreed to come on the condition that if found guilty, he would be granted safe passage on his horse ride home. Back then, the open-minded were murdered with impunity. He worried for his life. In our culture, open-minded has positive connotations, and closed-minded has negative connotations. In the Middle Ages, it was reversed. Being heretical or open-minded had negative connotations, and being closed-minded or orthodox had positive connotations. When you combine denotations and connotations, you get implicit rules. For example, since for us open-minded has positive connotations and closed-minded has negative connotations, either term implies a moral principle. Always be receptive to any possibility. Indeed, given the positive connotation, it's redundant to say always be open-minded. The positive connotation already means always. Likewise, for us, don't be closed-minded is redundant, since the negative connotations of closed-minded already means don't. Is there really a moral principle that one should always be open-minded and never closed-minded? Of course not. We addressed that question in the last session. Selective interaction means being open to some possibilities and closed to others. We filter. All organisms do. For humans, that includes being open to some concepts and not others. We each have limited attention. Open-minded, we spread our attention thinner. Close-minded, we focus it. We can't, won't, or shouldn't be receptive to everything. We never be able to focus or get anything done. Close-minded devoutness had positive connotations in the Middle Ages, and still does, but by different names. When we like that someone isn't receptive to competing interpretations, we use terms that denote close-mindedness, but with positive connotations. We call them faithful, orthodox, conservative, laser-focused, dedicated, committed, loyal, devout, or staying true. Same denotation, not being receptive to any possibility, opposite connotation— Committed makes it sound positive. Likewise, we can make open-mindedness sound bad. We can call it being wishy-washy, impressionable, easily distracted, ADHD, gullible, or spineless. We'll need to pay attention to such pairings of terms that denote the same thing but with opposite connotations. There are a lot of them, and they're critical to the a-hole's arsenal. They're arsenine asinal. I'm sorry. Surprisingly, there's no linguistic term for such pairings, so I'll call them counterspun pairs. For example, loyal and stubborn are counterspun pair. They both mean somewhat closed-minded, but one sounds positive and the other sounds negative. Having a vocabulary rich in such counterspun pairs is liberating. It frees us to imply opposite moral principles as needed when we want to rationalize our choices. We can pretend we're always following strict, exclusive laws while following them selectively. We can claim consistency without having to be consistent. We can cite whatever absolute moral rule justifies our motivations moment to moment. We can feel like we're living by the book while living however we want. As mentioned in class two, think of it as like claiming you'll lose weight by adopting not one, but all of the strict diets at once. They're diverse. You can usually find at least one that endorses eating anything you might want to eat. So be selective in their application. When you want to eat bacon, claim that you're on the keto diet. When you want to eat bread, claim you're on some low-fat diet. When you want to eat sugar, claim to be on some pop sugar diet. You're always on some strict diet. Indeed, you're on all of them, just selectively. The only thing you're not trying is consistency, and the only thing consistent about you is your pretense of consistency. You claim to be absolutely consistent in applying moral absolutes, all the while cherry-picking the rules that endorse whatever you want to do in the moment. We tend to think of the Bible as guiding us on the straight and narrow path to righteousness. It's interesting, then, just how many diverse behaviors have been justified by citing this supposedly sacred and perfectly integrated text. Between its history and close reading, it's evident that it's less a guide to the straight and narrow than a catalog of stories and precepts that one can employ selectively to justify a wide range of behaviors while pretending that you are citing a guide to an orthodox doctrine. The behaviors the Bible endorses tend to fall on two sides of a double standard, the behavior appropriate for responding to the orthodox and like-minded versus the heretics. With heretics, it's holy war. It's your orthodox duty to neglect, fight, and kill the devil's spawn. 
With your fellow believers, you are to be kind, generous, and loving. Many sects claim to embrace forgiveness, though with an emphasis on forgiving members of the sect. Right-wing evangelicals are all about forgiveness for right-wing evangelicals. All supposedly sacred texts have that insider-outsider quality, yet giving the impression of being fundamentally open-minded. Christ and Muhammad were inclusive, not exclusive. And if you aren't open-minded to their sacred texts' all-encompassing doctrines, you are closed-minded and a heretic too, confusing though that is. The Tao Te Ching is ironic about its mix of open and closed-mindedness. The term Tao is itself ambiguous. It means the way or path, but the term totters ambiguously between the way things are, the all-inclusive flow of possibilities, and the way to be with the way things are. It contains inclusive lines, like the Tao gives birth to both good and evil, but also exclusive lines about complying with the Tao. It teases at the tension between accepting everything as it is, or according with some but not other phenomena. Sacred texts aside, I'm suggesting that loaded language has the same ambiguous quality that can make you feel like you're consistent without having to be consistent. Earlier, I called this fluid hardlining. You draw a very hard line between good and evil, ally or enemy behavior, while maintaining the flexibility to move that hard line around anywhere you like. You can even flip the line over so that your unreceptivity is evidence of your steadfast loyalty and your rival's unreceptivity is evidence of their stubborn close-mindedness. With fluid hardlining, you draw a hard distinction and then move it around anywhere you want. You can pose as the butcher who always cuts at the joints while making a bloody mess and dulling the blade because really, you're cutting wherever you want in the moment. Such fluid hardlining makes confirmation bias easy. We can flatter ourselves as open-minded for embracing the concepts we like and pride ourselves as committed for rejecting the concepts we don't like. We're not closed-minded, we're loyal. We're open-minded, not wishy-washy. We can flatter ourselves as always living by moral principles while we change them as needed through loaded terms. And we can evoke other people's emotions by wielding connotations aggressively. People who aren't receptive to us are just closed-minded. Shame on them. They're not living by the moral principle that one should always be open-minded. Scorn them. Make them feel guilty for being unreceptive to us. That's how one can gain spin dominance, dominating people with the false appearance of consistency and absolute moral rectitude, at least to the extent they take you as meaning the words you say. People are surprisingly gullible to such spin dominance. For instance, take a word like quitter. It denotes leaving something, but its connotation is negative. As such, it implies a ridiculous rule. Never leave anything. You know that's a ridiculous, half-witted rule. Still, if you decide to leave something and someone calls you a quitter, you might well wince and even wonder if you're making a mistake. The person who calls you a quitter doesn't believe that bogus rule either. But they don't have to believe it. They just don't want you to leave, and so they lean on the negative connotation and play loose with the denotation, calling you a quitter as though they're merely describing your action, calling a spade a spade. They might even say, you're just a quitter, where just means ignore all other possible interpretations. To the extent you take them at their word, you might actually stay because of the spin-dominance spell they cast on you. More than a few people have lived to regret staying with something merely out of fear of being labeled a quitter. Quitting and freeing are counterspun pair. You can say, I'm not a quitter, I'm just freeing myself, as if those two terms were apples and oranges. They are, but only with respect to their connotations. Being a quitter sounds bad, freeing oneself sounds good, but their denotations are not apples and oranges, they both denote leaving something. There are plenty of other counterspun pairs. For example, love denotes a focused commitment to maintaining something or someone, but then so does addiction. What then is the difference between them? Mostly connotation. If you think someone's romantic partnership is good, you might say, that's love. If you think it's terrible, you might say, it's just an addiction. Always love, never be addicted, isn't really a moral principle. You can wield it subjectively any way you want. People sometimes say, same difference, but with the counterspun pairs, it's more like different sameness, the same denotation, different connotations. Another example, the serenity prayer corners us with a tough judgment call, but fudges a little with the term serenity and courage, which both have positive connotations, as if to imply that one should always be serene and courageous. 
Well, if you could always be both, you wouldn't need the wisdom to know or notice the difference between situations that call for one or the other. We can replace either term with their counterspun partner. Serenity denotes tolerance, which can be expressed with negative connotations as spinelessness. In the serenity prayer, courage denotes assertive insistence, which we can express with negative connotations as pig-headedness. It doesn't have the same sweet ring to it, but grant me the spinelessness to accept what I can't change, the pig-headedness to change what I can change, and the wisdom to know the difference. We could make a reference book of such counterspun pairs, with terms translated into three languages, neutralese, positivese, and negativese. Neutralese would be pure denotation with no emotional spin. The use of loaded terms is a kind of everyday gaslighting, the selective citing of principles to sway people to our interpretations. Fluid hardlining comes naturally to all of us. We aren't born with a commitment to integrity. We're born with emotions, and we learn words that we use for most to rationalize them. It's one reason we don't make 10-year-olds Supreme Court justices. Gaslighting is another spun or loaded term. It has very negative connotations. There are other negative terms for it, for example, manipulation. We also have positive terms for gaslighting. We call it the art of persuasion, influencing, shaping debates, promoting, selling, though that one's on the edge. Call it a sell job and it goes negative again. Anytime you've decided something, you'll want to spin it as the right decision, the best interpretation in contrast to all the wrong alternatives. You pull out all the positive ways to describe your selected option and all the negative ways to describe your rejected options. That's a promotional thumb on the scale, tipping a choice your way. We all spin and gaslight, in other words, persuade, even if only ourselves, saying what we need to hear, giving ourselves pep talks. Again, that's rhetoric, a term that has at times meant the art of speaking, but currently and here means coloring our words with evocative emotional connotations, positive and negative. We all try to define the frame of analysis, filtering out inconvenient and demotivating arguments and absorbing convenient, motivating ones for the choices and interpretations we make. A debate, conflict, argument, or fight is a spin war, dueling filters on where to focus, what's important or unimportant, and what outweighs what. Opponents use rhetoric to try to tip the scale their way, two people coloring the circumstances differently. Again, if we all do that, what distinguishes an a-hole? That remains an important question here, and given everyone's use of spin and counterspin, we can't solve it by saying that a-holes are biased that they gaslight, manipulate, or filter. We all do. Though we all do it, a-holes do it absolutely. That's the difference. A-holes tighten their grip on connotations to where they're all that matters to them. They give denotation as little attention as they can get away with. A-holes might cite some supposedly sacred catalog of optional behaviors, for example, the Bible or Koran or Das Kapital, as the source of their absolute authority. Still, such citing isn't necessary. They can simply wield the loaded terms of rhetoric any way they want to win debates with no consistency or attention to their terms' denotations. They can declare themselves patriots, Christian, loyal, honest, truth-seeking, loving, whatever. Why? Because those terms have positive connotations. Never mind what the words mean. A-holes ignore denotations as absolutely as possible. If it's positive-sounding, it's about them. If it's negative, it's about anyone who challenges them. Their rivals are closed-minded, mean, nasty, unkind, weak, spineless, wishy-washy, whatever. It doesn't matter to them so long as the connotations are negative. Taken to the absolute a-hole extreme, this approach makes for a very simple recipe for spin domination. First, pick a word or symbol that has absolutely positive connotations. I'll call this the white hat symbol. Your white hat symbol could be anything, whatever is popular in your local culture. A cross, a flag, the word God or Allah or Jesus or mindful, MAGA, open-minded, cool or truth. Then ignore its denotation and just focus on the fact that anything associated with it is reliably and eternally good. Next, pick a black hat symbol with absolutely negative connotations. It could be the devil, sin, a-hole, socialist, libtard, closed-minded, alt-right, the number 666, or the swastika, whatever is locally understood as bad. Next, ally yourself with the white hat symbol against the black hat symbol. Be melodramatic about it. 
You make a big commitment to the white hat symbol. For example, you are born again with Jesus against the devil. You're with MAGA against the libtards. Or you're with kindness against unkindness. Having embraced the white hat symbol against the black hat symbol, you'll feel like you're one with it, like a soldier in a holy war of good against evil. Since you're an ally of the white hat, anything that attacks you attacks it. Anyone who threatens you is threatening goodness itself. Anyone who challenges you is with the devil against God. It is your holy war duty to defeat them. So long as you ignore denotations, you can do that with any pair of opposite, absolute terms or symbols. One absolutely white hat positive, the other absolutely black hat negative. You're Christian. Anyone who challenges you is unchristian. You're a patriot. Anyone who disagrees with you is a traitor. You're mindful. Anyone who disagrees with you is unmindful. You're anti-PC. Anyone who resists you is PC. You're open-minded. Anyone who bugs you is closed-minded. You're a libertarian. Anyone who gives you a hard time is a liberal. You're anti-communist. Anyone who discourages you is a communist. This trick works best with symbols that have reached cultural saturation, with most people knowing the terms and their strong connotations. For example, in the U.S., most people hear the term Christian as having strong positive connotations and communist as having strong negative connotations. People may not be clear on what they denote. Still, they assume the terms refer to something real. The word a-hole is a black hat symbol. It has very negative connotations. But what does it mean? Well, that's what we're trying to find out here. We're trying to get some clarity on the meaning or denotation of the term. But even if people have never given any thought to what distinguishes a-holes, if they're called one, they'll probably feel put on notice that they're out of line. They'll back off the way a dog will when you shout, no, bad dog, no pooping in the living room. The dog doesn't know what those words denote, and it's not going to quibble over semantics with you. But the dog will respond to the negative connotations, and to a remarkable extent, we humans do too. It even works with people who don't subscribe to the popular sense of the term. For example, someone who finds social democracy interesting will be put on the defensive when accused of being a communist. They may not know why they're not communist in the technical sense, but still they'll respond to the pejorative connotation, perhaps getting defensive. With white hat and black hat symbols in hand, just use them with absolute confidence as though you know and care exactly what the terms mean, and you can shower yourself in glory and glower your rivals into shame. You can get people to cower like a dog just by shouting, traitor. If you insist loudly enough that they're being a traitor and you're being a patriot, they'll back off because they assume the words have denotations and they hear the connotations loud and clear. Being an a-hole is easy. All you have to do is insist with confidence that your opponents are traitors and that you're a patriot. Chances are good it will slow your opponents down and even get them to back off because they assume the words have denotations and they hear the connotations loud and clear. The words need not mean anything to you other than that you represent everything good and anyone who disagrees with you represents everything bad. Trump held sway for years, in part through forceful absolute spin dominance. While it appalled a majority of Americans, we couldn't put our finger on just what he was doing. Meanwhile, it wooed a large minority of Americans who started wielding their white hat and black hat symbols with Trump-like authority. But notice how much sway that minority had over the majority because of our dog-like reactions. We winced for way too long when they accused us of being communist, PC, or not making America great again. Reporters didn't try, let alone succeed, in cornering the MAGA cult with defining those terms, making their denotations explicit. We let them take over the country, insistent on the MAGA vision, without them actually having one. MAGA just meant hella good, and we would back off when accused of being commies or whatever other black hat epithet they spun at us. If we had tried to corner them with a definition, they couldn't have provided one. Their spun terms were all mutually defining. MAGA is against communism and PC. PC is communist and against MAGA. One could weave a whole spinplex of undefined terms pointing to each other. It's just a giant hat rack of denotation-free, connotation-heavy, black and white hats.
If you try to corner a spin dominator, chances are they'll just spin that too. For example, they'll accuse you of being abstract, bad, intellectualizing, bad, not sticking to the facts, bad, as though they are heroes of scientific realism, good, or critical thinking, good. If you read the Trump trolls, you'll find them preening about what critical thinkers they are, unlike libtards who are dumb hypocrites, bad, for not agreeing with them. But if you ask them what critical thinking denotes, they wouldn't know, other than that by proudly claiming they are critical thinkers, they win. Critical thinking is what good people like them have, and anyone who disagrees with them is not a critical thinker. Ignoring denotations is a liberation that makes it ever easier to rest confidently that one is right and righteous. It's what we mean by weaponizing. It means ignoring denotations and wielding connotations as shields and weapons. On the positive side, take words like nice or kind. People will often say be nice as though that's a moral principle. But if you ask them to define nice, they probably wouldn't have given it much thought, if any. What they mean is be nice to me and mine. It's not a moral principle. It's a subjective way to dog people into backing off. Again, because its connotations are positive and its denotation is at best vague. We can't be nice to everyone always. There will be trade-offs. To be nice to one person, you'll be less nice to another. If you had to choose between two candidates for a job, the one who gets it might think you're nice, and the other might think you're not nice. How does be nice guide us in such situations? When I hear be nice, I think always throw. Throw what? Throw is a verb that requires an object, as in throw the ball. Be nice can take an object, be nice to him, but it doesn't need an object. If you wanted to use be nice as a moral principle, you would have to specify an object. Be nice to infants works. But be nice always to everyone? It's vacuous. What people call a post-truth society is a society in which a-holes are rampant, ignoring denotations and focusing only on connotations. A-holes are denotation deaf, systematically inattentive to what their spun words mean. Words become meaningless, used only as shields and swords, in the service of the a-hole's confirmation bias holy war. Denotation deafness is also why a-holes can so readily label as fake anything that challenges their authority. They weaponize the word fake too. Fake denotes untrue, unlikely, unrealistic. But that's irrelevant when fake gets weaponized. All that matters is its negative connotation. It implies a rule. Never be fake. Stripping fake of its grounding and denotation, an a-hole can act as the supreme ruler, declaring fake anything they don't like. With denotations ignored, a-holes can pose as the measure of all things, the Roman emperor thumbing up and down by his subjective yet God-posturing standard, so long as people let them get away with it. Non-a-holes do let them get away with it by not distinguishing carefully between denotations and connotations and by taking them at their word. When dealing with ordinary people, we recognize the potential for spin, but we assume people mean what they say enough to tether their words to their grounded meaning in reality. If you're talking about patriots, you're talking about people who care about their country's future. It's not just some free-floating flattery, as it is when weaponized by a-holes. Imagine that we did have a reference book of counterspun pairs, or rather a lookup table programmed into a computer. It would be easy to program the computer to act like an a-hole, a douche bot, robotically flattering itself with positive terms and flinging negative terms at any human rival interacting with it. If the rival said, you're close-minded, the douche bot would spit out, no, you're close-minded, I'm loyal, I'm the most open-minded person ever. If the human said, you're pig-headed, the douche bot would say, no, you're pig-headed, I'm steadfast, I'm the most serene person ever. The douchebot could select rules, too. For example, hey, be nice in response to any challenge, and hey, always be open-minded when the human tried to counter anything the douchebot said. The douchebot wouldn't have to remember what it said nor what it was saying. Consistency and denotations would mean nothing to the douchebot. It would just have to be programmed with some basic grammar and the ability to pick positive terms for itself and negative terms for anyone talking to it. Still, anyone talking to it would hear words, terms they assume would have denotations that they understood. When the douchebot claimed to be a scientist or a critical thinker merely because those are attributes with positive connotations, the human would be bewildered, confused, and disoriented. To the normal human, those words mean something. A human would be more literal-minded. They wouldn't know that they were talking to a mindless douchebot.
If an a-hole accuses you of being unpatriotic, uncaring, stubborn, closed-minded, fake, whatever, you'll be thinking about those terms denotations, and they won't be. The more you care about being a good person, the more receptive you'll be to the a-hole's shaming, scolding, dogging, and scorning. You'll wince at accusations that are just weaponized sounds to the a-hole. A-holes could lead you around by the nose wherever they like. They could put you on the defensive with a confident, casual blurt of any of the connotation-loaded sounds without giving their sounds' meanings a moment's thought. Liberating themselves from denotations, a-holes discover that confirmation bias can be the solution to all of their problems. Comfort in their own skin becomes all that matters, and they can wield society consistently in their favor by carving it to their liking, praising with loaded terms anyone who agrees with them, and cursing with loaded terms anyone who doesn't. They no longer have to wonder about carving the world at its proper joints. They carve it any way that pleases them, and can recarve it on a whim. They gain total mobility and total authority. They can do no wrong and do anything they want. It's not just the terms they use, but the way they weave them into narratives and dress them up with passionate prosody and gestures. Trump's former fixer, Michael Cohen, describes the state of mind he entered in his former fixer role as like method acting, fully embodying the fictional part one is playing, mustering authentic, vivid, body-quaking feelings merely for theatrical effect. He describes knowing that something was a lie, but feeling real rage when defending it as true. Truth is the casualty of this expedient use of method acting. Yes, a-holes feel it. It's not hard. Like method actors, they just have to forget what they know about reality to submerge fully into whatever role they're playing. They swap out honor for success as their core identity. It's a game. Life's a game. Integrity, heart, and mind are burdens easily shed for the victory gained by believing their own lies. Once success becomes reliable, one can shift from lying to bullshitting. Lying is knowing you're not telling the truth. Bullshitting, as defined in Harry Frankfurt's bestseller on bullshit, is not caring what's true. The transition to an exclusive focus on connotation, not denotation, helps explain how smoothly one can slide from lying into bullshitting. Bullshitting is the power of connotation unchained. Words as shields and weapons in a simple crusade for spin dominance. It's as easy to ask the wrong question about a-holes as it is about animals. Does Trump really feel his outrage when he's defending lies and bullshit? Did Hitler really believe the Jews were an evil menace? Are they dumb or dumb like a fox? Are they passionate about their causes or just obsessed with getting their way? That's like asking whether a chicken thinks you're laughing at or with it. Wrong question. A-holes simply behave as though the rules don't apply to them. They're right, though not the way they assume. They are not like normal people. We put ourselves at significant risk by assuming they mean anything they say. That's exactly what they want. They speak with intense method-acting passion, as though they mean what they say, caring about it so much that their passions must override everyone else's considerations. Consciously or unconsciously, they work to keep you thinking that they're thinking when they're not. They're feeling. That's why we need to think of them as a different kind of critter. Not that they aren't human or can't change, but they're operating nonetheless by different rules. Our confusion about what's going on with a-holes can make them seem more complicated than they are, which is like deciding that a chicken's thinking must be complicated because it's foreign to us. Cunning is the impression a-holes give, but it may be gained by dumbing down, not attending to denotations, fleet-footed hopping from one high horse to another. You'll remember from class four the challenge of categorization and how we do it by means of abduction, finding traits in common between different things, like if it walks and talks like a duck, or like finding your car in the parking lot. Abduction is a concept in logic, but that doesn't mean that in practice it's divorced from emotion. We can be very selective about the traits we do and don't find in common between different things. For example, consider lawyers arguing their case by drawing parallels to other cases. That's abduction. You've got two opposing lawyers, each arguing for different parallels at the behest of clients, who want their case spun as like some cases and not others. Or think of the religious fundamentalist who finds evidence for God selectively, drawing some parallels and contrasts but not others. Or Trump, attending only to the parallels between what he does and positive outcomes, never acknowledging the negative outcomes. 
We all tend to spin our interpretations of circumstances to our emotional advantage, to the extent that we can get away with it. And we get away with it a lot easier if we ignore denotations. A-holes use spin dominance absolutely. Trump got away with spinning himself as a patriot and his enemies as traitors so long as enough people were dogged into submission by his connotations. We have a higher high horse to visit next. To reign supreme as an a-hole, you can't just get the last word through spin dominance. You must also get the last word on who gets the last word. That's frame dominance, the subject of our next session.